Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Jewish Arts and an Open Studios program. The series is curated and hosted by Judy Joseph and I. Team members are Hannah Wiesenthal Elias and Chesley Nameto. Judy, to you. Welcome to everyone. The Open Studios programs feature artists who are members of the Jewish Art Salon who have responded to a call or were invited. Please note, the Jewish Art Salon website has a new call for artists for the next Open Studios program after the flood regenesis. We welcome you to submit your art. Submission deadline is April 10th. And mark your calendars. Next Sunday, March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, not our usual time, we will have a special edition of the Open Studios program featuring Jewish Art Salon members who are included in a juried exhibit Authenticity Identity at Addis Israel Congregation in Washington, DC. Jewish Art Salon artists, Bilha Zussman, Diana Kurtz, Rachel Cantor, Hillel Smith, and Heather Stoltz will be featured, along with commentary by curator Ori Soltz and exhibition organizer, Robert Bettman. Our featured artists today are Mark Podwall, Cynthia Beth Rubin, and Yona Verver. All of today's artists are well-versed in Jewish tradition and history. Mark's expertise as an illustrator lends a graphic clarity to his paintings. He takes complex histories and narratives and distills them in a thoroughly original way, presenting juxtapositions that are sometimes whimsical and always thought-provoking. Yona and Cynthia present a riotous mashup. <coughs> Excuse me. Yona's well-developed techniques as a painter are viewed through the screen of Cynthia's innovative digital work. This oversimplifies their work together, which is replete with art history, yet presents as kaleidoscopic and timeless, always on the cutting edge of digital innovation and conceptually groundbreaking. Here's Dorit. Yona Verwer, founder and president of the Jewish Art Salon and Cynthia Beth Rubin have collaborated works which includes interactive web weaving stories of past and present in imagery evoking the former Im immigrant neighborhood of New York and of biblical narratives. They use traditional paintings, collage and acrylics and combine it with digital techniques the interactive series explores hidden videos of the images, music, and a bit of history. Mark Codwell paintings, drawings, and prints are of Jewish history, traditions, and legends. Artists presenting today will focus on Passover art. First presenter, Mark Codwell's work, have been exhibited and published worldwide. He is the author and illustrator of numerous books, most of which focus on Jewish themes. His art is represented in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Israel Museum, the Jewish Museums in Prague, Berlin, Vienna, and New York, among many other venues. The French Ministry of Culture named Podwell an officer of the Order of Arts and Letters. Moreover, he received the Foundation of Jewish Culture Achievement Award and the Foreign Ministry, the Chess Republic's Gratias Agit Award. Czech television has produced two documentaries on Podwell's art, a 374-page monograph we imagine 45 years of Jewish art by Mark Podwell received the Star Review in Library Journal, which said, the book is a wonder to behold, especially for lovers of art, books, and Judaica. Mark, please unmute yourself and share your screen. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate. And I thank all those who've joined uh, this program. I'm going to show a series of slides beginning with the most recent ones. In 1593, the first Sefer Min Hagim with illustrations was published. It was published in Venice. Subsequent editions were published many years in Amsterdam. The woodcut illustrations have been uh, repeatedly 
published as book covers, as note cards, as encyclopedia references. And so I decided that uh, these works needed a makeover. And so I created a series of 26 collages and I'll show you the ones related to Passover. The first one is uh, baking matzah. This is what the original 1593 woodcut looked like. This is my variation with a microwave instead of the, the, the oven. <laughs> Here I added a Hebrew clock and its hands are Torah pointers referencing the 24 hours one has to wait for kashering. And here I added a piece of bread. And the days of the Omer are linked to Passover. And here on Lag Bomer, someone is getting his hair cut with a hair blower. I tried as best as I could to make the collage elements look like they were actually part of the original woodcut. And this is the cover for the book. It'll come out on May 1st. It's the catalog for the exhibition at the Skirball Museum in Cincinnati, a collage of customs. The exhibition was supposed to open in March, but because of COVID, it'll open in February, 2022. And this is the cover to the catalog, which shows Purim, and it's based upon the Talmudic saying, one should drink so much on Purim that one cannot distinguish between uh, blessed be Mordechai and cursed be Haman. So it's an empty wine bottle with a Megillah inside. I've illustrated three Haggadot over the last 50 years. The first was Let My People Go a Haggadah. The, um, the illustrations were based upon an exodus from the Soviet Union. And this is the sketch for the Wicked Son. And this is one of a two page spread and it shows uh, the children of Israel as slaves erecting a huge hammer and sickle. This was for the New York Times food section on Passover, the Passover plate with Jerusalem in the center. In 1389, there was a terrible pogrom in Prague and it was on Easter Sunday, which was the last day of Passover. 900 Jews were murdered. The, the elegy says 3000, but there weren't 3000 Jews in Prague at the time. The Jewish communities um, sought refuge in the Altnoi Shul and in the Alta Shul, where they were hacked to death. And the elegy by Rabbi, by Rabbi Avigdor Karo is read on Yom Kippur that describes how the Christians then went to the cemetery to dig up the bodies look at, looking for jewelry. So this is the illustration for that pogrom. And this is a drawing from my book with Elie Wiesel, The Golem. Passover plate with the Alt Neuschul in flames. The second Haggadah that I illustrated was with Elie Wiesel. It was published in 1992, and it's now in its 21st printing. There was also a video based on this Haggadah that was broadcast on PBS um, for several years. One of the ink drawings, all the drawings were ink drawings, and this is the um, Passover table, the Seda table, leading back into Egypt. This is the drawing for the uh, drowning in the Red Sea. And this is the drawing for in every generation men rise up against us. So there's the temple burning in Auschwitz and the roads leading to Auschwitz are inverted railroad tracks, an inverted menorah with railroad tracks. This is the Golden Gate with the Messiah and Elijah sounding the trumpet. And for Chad Gadyo, the helmet, the, the allegorical helmets, the allegorical nature, nations that are described in Chad Gadyo become helmets devouring each other. And then these illustrations were used for a Seder in Washington, DC. For Francine Clagsburn's book Jewish Days, I painted all the signs of the Zodiac and for uh, Passover for the month of Nisan was a ram uh, made of matzah. And from Jewish Days, uh, an illustration of the Passover table being the Haggadah. And this was for an exhibition at Forum Gallery called Haggadah. It's an open book with Jerusalem 
and uh, towns from all around the world around the book. The Metropolitan Museum uh, had requested permission to reproduce my drawing uh, Hebrew Zodiac that was in the collection of the, um, the Skirball Museum. And it did so well. I, I was so excited they were doing it. I didn't ask for a royalty. I didn't ask for anything. But it was a Met bestseller. So when the Met asked me um, to design a SATA plate for them, I asked about a royalty and the response from the director of reproduction at the Met was, you know, we're not used to dealing with living artists. So I got a royalty and then I did another plate for them too. And, I, and my work has been reproduced on 16 items for, from the Met Museum. When I was meeting about this SATA plate, uh, the director of 3D reproductions asked, can the plate be square? I said, sure. He said, well, we have a mold here from Portugal and we can maybe use that and so actually they had a bo box of matzah at the Met at that moment and a piece of matzah fit right into the depression in the center. One of my favorite paintings is matzah moon because Passover is always a full moon. So it's a matzah moon over a shtetl. And um, I've done variations of this. One is in the collection of the Jewish Museum in Prague. And I like this image so much that for the 20th printing of Elie Sagada, I requested that it be reproduced on the cover. So this is the cover for the 20th printing and for the subsequent printings. In 2011, I was asked by Nanette Stahl, who's the uh, Judaica uh, librarian at Yale, who I would recommend to illustrate a Haggadah in color because she assumed I didn't want to do a third Haggadah. But I was looking to do a Haggadah in color because starting with my first children's book in 1994, I started to publish in color. So I suggested myself, but then I had a hard time with Simon and Schuster because the contract didn't allow for any competing books. Finally, after eight weeks, they gave permission when it was explained to them that a reform Haggadah is not going to compete with Ellie's Haggadah, which is the full uh, Orthodox text. So this is the first illustration for, the, for sharing the journey from CCR Press. This is Holach Mahanya. This is the bread of affliction of the uh, pyramid made from a matzah. These are the four sons, which are translated as the four children, with the wise son. His body is the Torah. He has an open book. The wicked son has no head because his book is thrown to the ground. And then um, the other sons, such as the one who cannot ask a question, it's closed books. This is the illustration for in every generation men rise up against us. So it's the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the, the Greeks, Nebuchadnezzar, the Romans, the Capitoline Wolf, and the Crusaders. This was the logo of the Knights of Templar, two knights on a horse because they said they were such a poor organization, two knights had to ride on one horse. Illustration for a pharaoh who knew not Joseph, with pyramid eyes, an obelisk nose, and a snake for a tongue. The illustration for the drowning in the Red Sea, where the Torah becomes the sea and is closing on them. And then I wanted to include Miriam's cup and wasn't sure what to do. And then I thought, oh, I'll put an orange peel on the edge of the cup based upon um, the the initial idea that a, um, a woman belongs on the bima just as an orange belongs on the seda plate, which is not a true story at all. It's, it's just fiction. And Susanna Heschel later explains the true um, root of that. My favorite image in that Haggadah is Chad Gajor, where the animals are linked in musical notes. So it's, it's the dog and the cat, and, um, and the, the cat and the goat and so on. In 2014, I had an exhibition at Terezin. It was uh, 42 works on the history of anti-Semitism. Each work looked like a double page spread from a book with on the right side, a verse from Tehillim Psalms. This was the illustration for the blood libel in Polna, 1899, Leopold Hilsner 
was convicted of killing a Christian girl. It was said to be a blood libel. Uh, he was then convicted of killing another woman. And 19 years after being in prison, the emperor of, of um, the Austrian uh, Hungarian emperor released him. This is Polna, this is a Matsumun with a blood red sky. And the Hebrew is Psalm 16, 4, I will have no part in the drink offerings of blood. The Song of Songs is, is read on the Shabbat during Passover. This was one of eight illustrations for an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in Prague on the Song of Songs. Um, in 2016, I was invited to speak at a conference on the history of the Jews of Dubrova Bielostrzka, which was where my mother was born in 1921. Uh, Dubrova had a 78% Jewish population in 1904, which was perhaps the highest percentage Jewish population in all of Russia. This was the cover of the book. This was the town in 1939. This was the town in 1941 when the Nazis burnt the town to the ground. And this was the exhibition poster for the exhibition of the prince in Bialystok with Matsumun over Dubrova. During the COVID epidemic, when my office was closed for eight, when my medical office was closed for 10 weeks, I illustrated Heinrich Heine's The Rabbi of Bacharach, which was an unfinished novel about a blood libel, where during a Seder, two strangers come and are invited to sit with the guests and they plant a dead Christian body underneath the table. And the rabbi realizes, and when everybody gets up to wash their hands, the rabbi and his wife, Sarah, flee for Frankfurt. This is Bacharach, how the town still looks. There's the castle on the hill. This is a uh, two panels of a triptych to represent anti-Semitic uh, imagery. This is a blood uh, ritual, blood murder, a Jew with money, Satan, Ecclesia and Synagoga, and a Jew riding a pig. This is the Werner Chapel, which the ruins of which still exist in um, in Bacharach, and this is the town. And in uh, 1287, a Christian boy Werner was found killed. The Jews were blamed as a ritual murder. And the uh, towns along the Rhine, from the middle to the lower Rhine, the Jews were massacred. So this is the Rhine filled with blood. And uh, the, the boy was made a saint. In 1963, the sainthood was removed with an apology from uh, Pope Pius, Pope John the Twenty Second, uh, saying that uh, there was no blood mur libel murder. This is from the Rabbi Bacharach at Torn Haggadah, a Pesach um, Torah plate. And that's the drawings. Wonderful presentation. And Mark, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, what medium, what kind of uh, medium did you paint those? Uh, it's colored pencil. And initially I was using matte uh, acrylic, but I found that the matte acrylic, when you would paint over layer over layer, it would peel and flake. Well, I would no, I was using gouache and colored pencil. But with gouache, when I would paint over and over it, it would flake, so I was told I would, it was recommended that I use um, golden matte acrylics. And so I use matte acrylics and acrylics. Um, Mark? Yes. Uh, hi, it's Richard. Um, well, first of all, wonderful presentation. You know, lots of work that I hadn't seen of yours. Uh, a, a kind of question I would never ask, but I think we all may face. So don't. You mentioned, you, you mentioned royalties. Yeah. Um, so, you are rather successful. Uh, you have, you know, done op-eds for the New York Times, and you 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 detailed your various successes. Am I right in assuming that nothing gets off the ground until whoever is interested in your work or you're proposing to understands that artwork is not free and it needs to be paid for? Because I think a lot of people, I, I wouldn't be surprised if many people on this call have you know, are not nearly as successful. And in fact, have, encouraged, have encountered things where they're asked to do things, either create works of art or be on a panel, speak about their expertise and never being paid or really being up against the wall. So I'd like to hear a little bit of your experience in that. 
So my experience is I do many things for free. If, if I'm somehow involved with the organization, and uh, for example, for Hebrew Melodies, which I illustrated and got um, two friends to do the translations from the German, when I heard that the translators were only going to get translator fees, but because they're both published poets and, and fairly well known, I said, don't give me an advance, don't give me any royalty. I want all my world, all my money to go to them because I felt it was such an important book and the publication of the book was my reward. To, to be frank, when I'm dealing with an organization and I feel I'm going to have lots of aggravation from them, I don't want to give an example of one. There was one where I got a $50,000 fee in, in, in anticipation of the aggravation, which did come, but I felt that I was paid to accept it. For books, when I'm dealing with a university press, I may not want an advance or a very small royalty, or may do it for free. When I'm dealing with a major publisher, Random House, Simon Chester, I just received a royalty check yesterday for the Haggadah I got with Ellie, which um, I've been receiving royalty checks since 1993. But when I did the video for PBS and Time Warner, there was, there was an advance, so it depends who I'm dealing with. And um, there, are, there are times that I'll do, for the Alt Neuschul in Prague, I designed all the textiles with no fee. I raised $75,000. Whereas when I'm dealing with someone else, there's a fee. I think it's interesting what you said about the aggravation. I, I have a term for that too. I call it combat pay, but mine is a well, lot less. So Rachel Braun had a question. Do you want to unmute and ask Mark your question, Rachel? Yes, um, thank you. I'm curious to know your experience when you work in collaboration versus when you're working on your own. Is there a certain kind of rush that comes from collaboration versus a different kind of maybe fire that comes from working? What is that experience like? Good question. When I'm working in collaboration, I'm really working on my own. In terms of when I worked with Ellie Wiesel over the years, only three times did he make suggestions. Once was don't draw Hebrew letters just for decoration. Don't draw Holocaust survivors. And don't draw the face of the Maharal in the Golem book because we don't know what he looked like. Those are the only times Ellie ever made any suggestions. When I worked with Francine Prose on four children's books, what, what would happen is when I did the Golem, I did the drawings before I had the text. When I did the Haggadah with Ellie, I, I did the drawings before I had the text, but I wanted to include a drawing of Jerusalem as the crown of the Torah. So I asked Ellie to write a, uh, some explanation why that drawing, something about Jerusalem, which Ellie then put it, gave me a sentence that he felt would um, be the text for that drawing. But I said to Ellie, I don't think that sentence is good enough. Try something else. And he did. We had such a good relationship I didn't feel I was insulting him and he wasn't insulted. With Francine Prose, there were times where I suggested there, where she, um, in that book about the Lamed Vovniks, she had something with 36 camels. And I said, no, no, have, there'll be 36 lights of the menorah because there's an explanation that when you add up all the lights of, of uh, Hanukkah is the 36 representing Lamed Vovnik. And so um, usually I just work completely on my own. And usually I don't show the author the images until I'm done. And, it, it's, and also, and when I work with Harold Bloom, he, um, I showed him everything when I was done. And I've only worked with people that I can have that kind of relationship. On one project, I don't want to mention what it was, the, uh, the editor was making all these suggestions which were literal illustrations. And I don't do literal illustrations. When I worked for the New York Times for 40 years off that page, it was to enhance the text. It wasn't to mirror the text. And when the editor was telling me, when the author of the text was telling me 10 suggestions for literal illustrations, I told the publisher, you're gonna to have to get someone else if I'm gonna work like this. And the, uh, the publisher said, do whatever you want. Those magic words, those golden words, do whatever you want. 
Um, Hetty has a question. Go ahead and unmute Hetty. Okay, I'm unmuted. It's really two questions. I'm getting in two strikes uh, at asking a question. First, do you use historic Haggadot as a source for your illustrations? And if yes, or if no, why? And secondly, you deal with a lot of very uh, difficult subject matter in terms of um, gruesomeness, the blood libels and so forth. And how do you strike a balance between uh, accuracy and whimsicalness that your, your illustrations spark? Well, the Amsterdam Haggadah, depiction of the temple, I repeatedly use that as an image for the, uh, the temple. Um, and I used it multiple times in Ellie's uh, Haggadah. I also used it in the CCR Press Haggadah. So there are times where I'll pick something up from the past and incorporate it into my drawing. Concerning uh, whimsy and um, macabre subjects, I, you know, I'm not going to make light of the macabre subject. And it's just, it's, um, you know, it depends on whether I can make something whimsical or, or I can't. And uh, when I was working on the series of the 42 images for the Karazin exhibition, it was very depressing. Um, of course, I, depending, the Chelnitsky massacres or reading about the Chelnitsky massacres where they would, um, the, the Cossacks would cut off the arms and legs of a Jew and have a cart roll over them or they would sew a cat in the belly of a pregnant Jewish woman. The, the things were just horrible. And, um, but it's, and, What's very depressing is when I'm working on Holocaust material and I'm looking at photographs of naked Jewish women being ridiculed in the streets of Lvov or Vilna. And it's just, it's horrible, but I, I have to look at those things and repeatedly look at those things to get into the mindset to what I'm going to do. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think we're gonna have to move on to our next presentation, but. Uh, your work is, is incredible, and I, I, loved, I love the way you use an easy line for weighty topics. Um, thank you very much. It's really thank unique. You. So thank you again. Thank you. So um, now I'd like to move on to our next presenters. Cynthia Beth Rubin is an early adopter of digital imaging, transitioning from paint in the 1980s. Rubin's prints, videos, and interactive works have been shown on the ICC Tower facade in Hong Kong, the Jewish Museum in Prague, the Cotton Club screen in Harlem, the ICA in London, and the Jerusalem Biennale, and numerous international festivals featuring digital art, such as ISEA and SIGGRAPH. Equally fascinated by imagined memories of cultural history and with envisioning the unseen microscopic life of oceans and still waters, her works evoke narratives through interwoven layers of representation and abstraction, frequently combined with interactive experience. Jona Verver is a Dutch born and New York based. She is a multimedia artist and muralist whose works explore personal and collective identity, history, tikkun olam and Kabbalah. She holds an MFA from the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague, the Netherlands. Her series, Book of Yona, Troubled Waters, and Urim and Tumim are collaborations with artists Katarzyna Kozera and composers Alon Nehushtan and Don Schwartz. With artist Cynthia Beth Rubin and web developer Chris Tonsky, she contributed to the interactive Zodiacs and the Lower East Side. Verver's work has been exhibited at the Jerusalem Biennale, Andy Warhol Factory, Maisel Museum, and Harod Museum, the Holocaust Memorial Center, the Bronx Museum, amongst others. She's been reviewed in the New York Times, the New Art, uh, the New Art Criticism, Ars Judaica, and the Huffington Post, and in Ori Salt's Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture. And now we will watch the presentation. Thank you. And we are talking about 
um, holiday of Passover, which falls in the Hebrew month of Nisan, which corresponds with the month of April, late March. And of course, we know it as the month of Pesach, where we tell the story. Um, and we also think of it as the start of spring, although in Israel, spring has already started here in North America, it's really the start of spring. And the video I wanted to show you was from 2020 because that also, we have been experiencing our own plague and it's important to kind of put all of this in that context, it's in our mind. The story of Passover has been told for many years, uh, of course, and uh, we brought this idea of telling the story as a collaboration, our shared experience as artists is one of the things we're gonna focus on today what we had in common in terms of our love of texture. And here is our first collaborative work. Yona, you were going to? Yeah, it's uh, at the invitation of the Maisel Museum in Denver. And this was actually at the Evergreen Art Center. So why did we choose to collaborate on the Stanton Street Shul? Because you're going to see a lot of ideas woven around here. And one of them is that we focused on this and it's, it's in my work, I've been working with visual traditions, artifacts and historical sites, kind of linking to his historical memory and Yona. I work with biblical texts, uh, Jewish mysticism and community experience. And this movie here is of the Stanton Street Shul, a small synagogue in New York's Lower East Side from 1913. Poland, where this congregation is from, had a tradition where synagogue walls were often painted with Jewish zodiac images depicting 12 months, each related to 12 tribes. Here you can see them in the shul. Um, these zodiac paintings are an echo of the life that the immigrants left behind. And this was shot, by the way, before the synagogue was renovated. And I was a congregant there at the time. So working from this really brought together my love of, of thinking about history and entering um, spaces that had it carried with it a kind of cultural memory and Yona's interest at the time, we've since merged, we kind of crossed a little bit, um, but Yona's interest at the time. I'm gonna turn this up a little. So this is a piece in the Jerusalem Biennale. It was a banner, six foot tall a painting in which little videos were embedded and viewers would wave an iPad over the banner and videos would pop up, pop up on the iPad wherever we had embedded a video. So you see a few of those little videos here. A lot of we're going to put commentary back and forth about the nature of Mazel and whether it's something that's astrological or something that's even of uh, a bizarre, which is uh, I don't worship of some type. That's Alyssa Sampson's voice. And we actually included that little quote because people ask us about it. So we wanted to bring this interactivity to the web. And we asked Chris Tonsky, who's a web designer, to join us as a collaborator. And so we made this website that has, um, we've been adding to it slowly. This was an impetus to keep adding. and. Here is the image of uh, the month of Cheshvan, for instance, which corresponds with November and the zodiac sign of Scorpio. This is my aunt singing and in Yiddish, and it shows the, the idea of looking at the present uh, in the Lower East Side and back, remembering back to Eastern Europe and, of course, the fish. So. And getting back to thinking about the Passover story, this is a Sephardic Haggadah that again shows people having the Seder, um, shows the plight of enslaved people. And these are all things that are on our mind. And of course, the plague of lice. And I just want to come back to this idea that we ourselves, we have to acknowledge that we have been living through a time of the plague. And I think it changes everything that we think about. So, and so very briefly, the story of Pesach, which most of you know already, uh, the Jews had moved to Egypt after hundreds of years. However, they had become so numerous that Pharaoh was threatened and um, took away their personal freedom and recruited them into slave labor. 
Um, at that point, Moses, through God, uh, brought plagues upon the country to have fire over land. And the tenth plague was the one of the killing of the firstborns. And that nine, night, the Jews' home was were passed over in this killing, um, and Jews were allowed to leave. So that's it, in a brief, in a nutshell. And now we're just going to go on and talk about our individual works for a minute to give you an idea of how we got here. So. So conquering the promised land. So after we left Egypt, we were encountering a new land, new people. How did that happen? Um, so a quote from the Bible is, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you've defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. So in other words, to achieve freedom for the Jewish people required a little bit of violence. Hence this image here, Urim and Tumen, by artist Katarzyna Kozera and myself. Now, another biblical quote is, he, Joshua, is to stand before Eliezer, the priest, who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out and they will come in. So what does that mean exactly? Joshua, the leader in charge of conquering the land, would go to the priest who would consult an object called the Urim to see if the Jewish people should go this way or that. Now, this Urim is actually called the Urim and Tumim, and it refers to an ancient um, Jewish tool of prophecy known as the breastplate of judgment. And inside it was a piece of a parchment on which the name of God was written several times, and it was mounted with 12 gemstones, each engraved with the name of the 12 tribes, worn by the high priest, so as in the sketch that you saw. And the cool thing about it was that individual letters in those stones would light up to display prophetic messages. But they're primarily to questions such as which way should we go? Should we attack this way or that way? So I started a series of paintings about this. This is Yehuda number one, my very first Jewish themed painting ever. Um, Yehuda, of course, is one of the 12 tribes. And I painted a detail of one of these gemstones. I wanted to emulate the inner light of the stones because I was intrigued by that mystical aspect. And the bottom right, for instance, simulates the facets of cut stones. Then I was told that that alphabet that I used is not the alphabet I had at the time. So I made this other alphabet here, which is uh, a Paleo-Hebrew characters. Um, it was made by scratching things in clay. Uh, so that's why it's more of a stick figure. The other alphabet didn't happen until Babylonia. So later on, I did a series uh, on the Urim and Tumim with another artist, Katarzyna Kozera. Again, this is our interpretation of the Jewish people wandering the desert after leaving Egypt and conquering the land. And in the background, you see the same Paleo-Hebrew letters spelling out the word Yehuda, because Yehuda is also the word that the word Jews is derived from. And we did several interpretations of these. So this is Urim and Tumim number five, which is a bit more explicit about the violence needed to gain freedom. And this is the Stanton Street amulet. This is a painting I made for the Stanton Street show where the Jewish Arsenal had its very first exhibition in 2009. Uh, so I had done a series called Temple Talismans. It was influenced by domestic terrorist uh, events targeting houses of warships. Uh, so this image, you know, it has the Statue of Liberty, which is an homage to the immigrants who built this community. And the animals and the candelabra are inspired by typically Galician Jewish motifs. And uh, the six pointed star at the bottom is part of the building's windows. So this whole piece was for the show. This is called Protection Amulet Gold from the series Kabbalah of Bling. I did a series of canvases with chains around him, you could actually wear them if you wanted to, it's kind of oversized bling, it was based on rapper's bling at the time. The Kabbalists used amulets and they were mentioned in the Talmud and they were very serious about using them as instruments for intervening in a national cor natural course of events. So um, this is protection amulets. Pewter, and this piece is about my own personal freedom. Uh, as some of you may know, I'm a convert to Judaism. Um, conversion is not allowed in the Netherlands for several reasons. Um, so this particular painting mirrors my life journey and that of Katarzyna. It entwines it with the life of my namesake, the prophet Jonah. 
It transposes the biblical whale to a submarine charting the Atlantic and arriving in New Year's East River. And here, this also echoes my journey from Europe to New York, from Catholicism to Judaism. It's uh, an image of immersion in the mikvah. The three dark figures in the foreground are the rabbis in charge of the conversion. And um, this brings me to slavery today in the world. Almost 21 people are still trapped in modern day slavery, including my own country, the Netherlands. So in the red light district, for instance, this year on is Amsterdam, uh, girls and women are held against their will. Um, so I made this piece 2019 in Amsterdam called Troubled Waters that dealt with an old problem and the current problem of slavery in the Netherlands. Um, so on the left is a piece um, about a past issue, which was Jewish women rounded up for uh, transportation to camps in World War II. The percentage of Jews in the Netherlands that died was higher, <clears throat> was very high, uh, higher than Poland, for instance. Um, well, on the right side, you will see a piece called about the red light district um, where these girls are being held against their will. And both of these images had embedded videos with sounds by composers Alon Mechustam and Dan Schwartz. This is my last piece in this presentation. And we're moving okay. on to Cynthia. So um, I want to talk about my own experiences with wandering and Passover and the change of time. This is a screenshot from last year when my family was having a Zoom Seder. Here I am, as I was saying last year, doing a Zoom Seder and also against a picture of uh, my family in 1944, having a Seder in Middletown, New York. It's my mother who's right front and center. And a year later, she would be in Red Cross training to go overseas for the war effort. So there's that whole sense of, of moving through time. And I realized that in my work, moving through time has been a theme. So this is a piece from 1991, where there's a North American building up in um, it, it house um, couple either side kind of motifs from Hebrew manuscript. This happens to be Quorum, I'm sorry, Scroll of Esther. Um, but I took the motifs from there and the idea of architecture is frequent in Hebrew manuscripts. I did that also in this piece where I took a Spanish manuscript and divided so that the bottom is North American imagery, at the top is Eastern European, and thinking about the juxtaposition of moving through time where it's kind of united by the motif from the manuscript. Uh, and in this case, I took a manuscript with towers in it and used it to represent my hometown of Rochester, New York, and actually the building where my father had his office when I was a child. So I'm kind of adopting this medieval way of thinking. Um, a lot of this came from working with the Marseille Bible, which was created in Toledo, Spain in 1260. And because I spent a lot of time living in the south of France, I was able to photograph it at the Bibliothèque Municipale. And I made an early digital, it's very early digital, really just the edge of scanning. I began pre-scanning. And I noticed that the architecture of the area really fit the manuscript. And so I went even further with it many years later, once scanning had been developed. And I actually had an artist residency at Song for Copier in Montreal, so I could do color photocopies and cut them up in the days when printing was not really possible. And I juxtaposed the motifs. And, and then I worked with Bob Gluck on doing this interactive piece. So the Bible was done in 1260 in Spain, went to Safad with the expulsion, disappeared for many years, 
and was found in the public library in Marseille um, by accident in around 1888. So we were interested in creating that idea of, of wandering through um, time and space because as an artifact, it of course existed for many years after that. And um, then I started to think about my own wandering. So in 1968, I did these drawings from nature where I was taking a biology class where I, and geology would a combined science class. I never learned science, but 40 years later, I had took those saying a photograph and combined them in these works. And so I did my own series, which I consider my 40 years of wandering and actually exhibited this at the Slipka Center for Jewish Life at Yale alongside the interactive piece that I did with Bob Gluck. Um, and this was an earlier piece from, well, it's from the year 2000, an interactive web piece that deals with going into spaces. These are all religious spaces, a cathedral, a mosque, and a synagogue, uh, two synagogues. And kind of thinking about if you were there, what are the different things that you notice? So this for me relates to the remembering and thinking about Passover that we are remembering his, historical um, parts of our world, but we're also thinking about life-sustaining ecosystems. This is kind of an update. It's not something that people did traditionally, but I've been working with oceanographers at the Mendendura lab at the University of Rhode Island. And actually some of the plankton scans here are done by members of that lab. And I'm very aware of the fact that we are so minuscule in the world that there are these millions untold number, uncounted number, literally of variations of plankton. And I've had the, the experience of being in the ocean and realizing that you know, in the ocean, we're just little specks. Um, and so I've been working on that a lot and brought some of these ideas. This is one of my recent pieces on Genesis that will be in the upcoming Jewish Art Salon exhibition on Genesis of thinking that everything always existed. It was created, but it actually all existed in the water. Um, and so that's for me. And now, Yona? And now this is a mural at the Stenson Street Shoe of the month of Nisan with the Passover lamb in it. Um, this, uh, this shows the whole uh, image. Actually, Cynthia, you want to talk about this? Yeah, so we put it together in um, through layers of weaving together a lot of bits of the Passover story. This is part of our series that's on the web that's interactive. We're still working over on the left. And we began with the idea of parsley because for many of us, when we sit at the Seder and we take that first bite of parsley, like, oh, now Passover has begun. It's such a strong feeling. And so it was really important to get that in. And here's a detail from the piece that shows how we worked in the parsley. I was so enamored with the parsley that I actually did a couple pieces that are just separate pieces, more than a couple. I did a whole series of parsley uh, of when I was working on this. And I've actually made a scarf of one of them and put it for, uh, on Zazzle or whatever. So here we are with the detail of the parsley and then this Passover cup has been in Cynthia's family for generations, and I was intrigued by its art deco design. I was also intrigued by the fact that she has Judaica handed down, you know, by her family, because, you know, as a convert, of course, I do not have that family tradition. Um, I made a little painting of it. Oh, it's right here. And um, I put, she talked about parsley so much, I put parsley into the frosted glass of the Passover cup. And here is how we integrated it into the piece. So here's the Passover lamb. In the middle is how it looks at Stanton Street. And the left is a, a detail of how we did it. Um, so the lamb stands for the Passover lamb. Um, at the night of the 10th plague, the Jews were commanded to slaughter a lamb, eat it, uh, put the blood on the lintels um, of the house. So that night, the, those houses that were painted were passed over 
And that is also why one of the items we have on the Seder plate is a roasted shank bone. Here you see an image with a very typical Lower East Side architectural elements, such as the acanthus leaves, that particular capital, and then you see on the left. Go ahead. Susan. And here we have wandering through the desert, which you'll see again when we show you the videos that we developed for this. And in the same fragment, we have the menorah that's in front of the ark at the Stanton Street Shul. So this is just. This, this is actually a video from another one of the months that shows the Statue of Liberty with my aunt singing in Yiddish. And this Liberty Amulet is part of a City Charm series that I made after 2011 to counter the post 9-11 sense of vulnerability. So these objects are made in a so-called protection devices. So now we're gonna show you what happens when you go to the web. So this is what it looks like when you move your mouse around and you get different videos. Um, in the interest of clarity, for this, we extracted the videos and put them on. So here again is uh, Miriam's cup with the water and the cup that actually belonged to my aunt Dottie, who's in many of the other videos. Um, she was my grandmother's sister. So this is a um, painting based on wallpaper from the Lower East Side from the early 20s. With my aunt singing. And here we have, this is a scene of the desert and imagining going into the fields of grain. So, uh, and this actually relates to the fields that you see in the Lul at harvest time. So here it is, you can go to the web and experience it, thanks to Chris Tonsky. So the lessons of Pesach, um, which we are thinking about, we wanted to emphasize this is remembering the past of Jewish people and all enslaved uh, people. And I think for many of us, these points, remembering enslavement, remembering that workers are being exploited, that we need to respect all people, and kind of this little addition of respecting the planet, um, which for myself has become a part of this. So we want our thank yous, um, the music and sound here uh, by Aunt Sylvia and both my father have long left this world, but we recorded and music by Bob Gluck and all of the people who have contributed to our individual work um, who we thank and all the people who made today possible. Thank you so much. So there we are. I will stop the share. Um, thank you so much. This was like fascinating. Individual work was great and the collaboration is just fantastic. I love what you're doing and it, it was amazing. And I wanna to go to your website again. Uh, first of all, wonderful presentation, both of you. Um, so um, this is not only for you, but also, I guess, um, for, for everybody, the use of historical motifs. It's fascinating. And uh, some people use them more than others. But I was wondering if you could comment on both its utility and how you approach it. Because of course, um, you don't live in the 12th century or the 13th or the 14th century. Uh, and yet you're looking using images and motifs that are very much of that time. And very much, I have to say, not of this time. We're in the 21st century. Uh, this is not a criticism. It's just commenting that it's something we all kind of do. And I think we'd like to hear your uh, approach to using historical motifs. And then one very specific question to Yona, um, <laughs> I'm going to put it very brutally. What's with the guns? <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, guns are guns, and I, you know, they they are. But it, it seems like you're using the gun motif a lot, and I was wondering if could you, you know, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, Cynthia, you go first about. No, the, I was going to let you answer the guns because I think that the medieval thing is a bigger for all of us. I mean, Mark may also want to jump in too. So. Okay, so the guns are really about 
you know, the ones in the Urim and Tumim were really about how the land was conquered with violence. And I'm not saying that I was against that, but, and of course they didn't use guns in those days, you know, but these are all like modern contemporary interpretations of the theme, hence the guns, you know. Um, so that's hopefully answers the gun question. How about you, Cynthia? Okay, so- Let me, let me, just, let me just ask though, but, and the uh, amulets? Because there were a number of amulets that you had with guns. Oh, oh, okay. So that's a different story. Um, they're actually part of a series that uh, criticizes uh, Kabbalah, how Kabbalah has been used these days by contemporary people, but particularly in uh, you know pop culture. So um, the guns stand for people, you know, wanting a full sense of security instead of a uh, spiritual sense of security. It's, it's a long story, which we can talk about it another time. So to talk about the medieval references, so I actually got into it completely backwards. Um, and that's another story. I think I may have talked about some of this in the short presentation that I did in June, but I've in other talks if you've heard me. Um, as a painter, which I was originally, although I became digital, I, I transitioned through the 80s. I first got on a computer in 81, or 82, and packed up the paints in 88, which are now coming out again, of course, but you know, that's no story. Um, and as a painter, I loved color, but um, form wasn't really my strong point. Um, also, so I was very aware, especially when I was in graduate school in the mid seventies and there were people returning from the Vietnamese war, the war with Vietnam and um, thinking about the fact that all of our references were Western wall art. And I wanted to break from that. People were not yet talking about Jewish art. It's just like, how am I gonna break from this? So I was in graduate school in Baltimore where um, there are the museums there have great collections of Indian and Persian manuscripts. And so I started with Indian and Persian manuscripts. And if you know anything about them, um, the stories that are told are actually kind of like, um, they don't happen at the same time. There'll be images that don't happen at the same time. So that's maybe something that also stayed with me. And when I did that for many, many years, and I thought, well, you know, I discovered Hebrew manuscripts just by accident. I was in New York on a Monday in the days when all the museums were closed on Monday, except for the Jewish Museum. And I went and there was an exhibit of Hebrew manuscripts. And I said, oh, I can switch to this. And I was actually the first artist who went to JTS and said, can I look at Hebrew manuscripts? And I was looking at original manuscripts before other artists were. So I went to the Bibliothèque Nationale, I went to the Bodleian, I went, um, to the museum in Jerusalem, I'm blanking on these names. And they brought me the originals because they just were like, no one's, they thought I was gonna study one manuscript for like two weeks, like all the other scholars, instead of like do some drawings, you couldn't take pictures of course, do some quick sketches and put it aside after like an hour. They're like, what? So um, anyway, time goes on, I'm in the South of France frequently. And I went to Marseille and the bibliothèque Tekar in Marseille, Madame Jacobi said to me, why don't you come back with your camera? I said, what? Um, and so I did. I, until literally the last two or three years, I had the biggest collection of photographs of the Marseille Bible. So that seemed, you know, really important to me. And it gave me some compositional structure. It took a long, long time for me to kind of relate it to being Jewish. You know, I, it was a transition. But I have to say when I touched the real manuscripts, that's when it happened. I mean, and that was, an, so that's a long answer. Um, by, by the way, when you, what you just touched on, if you pardon the pun, uh, is really a factor. Uh, and it's one of the problems we actually have. We look at things in reproduction. In fact, our almost entire visual sensibility is through something that is not real, it's a reproduction. But when you actually hold one of these manuscripts, which I've done as a journalist and going to Sotheby's and then talking about something and holding these things in your hand, the experience is totally different. And first of all, the scale is different. And I would encourage anybody who has access to auction houses where these manuscripts, manuscripts and actually artifacts come up, you can actually go in in the previews 
and they're more than happy to simply put it in your hand. And it's like, it is a, it's not only thrilling, but the experience is really radically different. And we can all do it, actually. And they are on exhibit. I mean, the Met Museum has had a few manuscripts on exhibit from time to time. New York Public Library, they are out there. So, anyways, okay. So the chat is full with compliments. Some of them are wonderful, brilliant, inspiring. You're gonna get the whole chat to your emails later. I just wanna thank Mark, Cynthia and Yona for outstanding presentations. You've given us so much to think about, but also just the sheer beauty of your work is so thrilling and inspiring. And I, I can't thank you enough for me and Dorit and the Jewish Art Salon. And I wanna thank the uh, people who attended as well. I hope that this is a source of inspiration for you as you do your own creative work. We have another program coming up next Sunday, uh, March 14th. As I had mentioned, I'm just gonna mention it again. It's at 2 p.m. Eastern time, so it's not our usual time. Featuring the Authenticity Identity Exhibit at Addis Israel Congregation in Washington, DC. And we're gonna spotlight about half a dozen Jewish art salon artists who are in the show and also hear the comments of Ori Salt. So I hope you can join us then. So thank you very much and uh, stay healthy and keep well. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. This has been such a wonderful experience. So it's just a pleasure to see everybody and be part of this group. So thank, thank you. you. It was an honor to have you all in this program tonight. Absolutely. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. I'm so happy I attended.